Hello, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us today for our discussion on the topic of public sector innovation. Um, we've got a fantastic panel with us today, um, and I'm very excited to be introducing them shortly. Um, but first of all, um, as uh, some of you who've seen our, our live discussions before will know, um, this will be a one hour panel discussion on, on the topic. Um, and we'll aim to add uh, around 15 minutes at the end for audience Q&A. Um, it, it is a live streaming session after all. Um, so, you know, we'd love to see your questions. If you could post them in the YouTube comments, we'll aim to um, get around to those at the end. Um, and so uh, just to very, very briefly introduce the topic today, um, we're here to discuss and explore um, a, a new way of understanding public administration through a complexity lens um, and asking if this new set of ideas and approaches from um, complexity theory, from systems thinking, systems innovation and related uh, fields, to what extent they can transform how the public sector approaches and well, well, operates to meet some of the challenges that we're facing in the 21st century. Um, and so on that note, I'm, uh, I feel uh, it's a great privilege for me to, to introduce the guest speakers today. Um, and first of all, uh, we have Eve Middleton, uh, Middle, Middleton Kelly, sorry, um, who was the founder and director of the Complexity Research Group at the London School of Economics, and now has a fellowship at Cambridge University. Um, Eve has been working with complexity theory for over 25 years and has developed a methodology to effectively address complex problems in both the private and public sectors. Um, Eve has led or co-led 49 major research projects with multiple academic and industry partners. Um, Eve has also acted as a policy advisor to numerous national governments, has authored, co-authored or edited six books and written over 35 papers on the theory and application of complexity theory. Um, next, we have um, Marco Steinberg, who is the founder and CEO of Snowcone and Haystack, which is a strategic design practice focused on helping governments and leaders innovate in order to adapt to the complex challenges of the 21st century. And prior to this, Marco was the strategic design director at Citra, uh, which is the uh, which is a uh, Finnish innovation fund where he launched a portfolio of initiatives to systemically address the acute need for strategic improvement in the public sector. And before Citra, Marco was also an associate professor at the Harvard Design School. Um, and lastly, we have Toby Lowe, who has spent 15 years working across the public and voluntary sectors in the UK, working in both policy and delivery roles. He is on secondment to CPI from Newcastle Business School, where he's been working alongside public and voluntary sector organizations to develop an alternative paradigm for public management, one which enables public service to work more effectively in complex dynamic environments. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Looking great to have you. Great to be here. <laughs> great to have you all. Um, and so I think just to kick things off, um, I think it would be great if we could just uh, go to each of the panelists and if you could describe um, briefly your own relationship to this topic of public sector innovation um, and why you think this topic is so important today. And maybe Eve, we could start with you for this and uh, move on to Toby and Marco. That's all right. Um, well, I think I feel quite, quite, I, I actually feel quite passionate about this because for, let's take, you know, be totally topical because what's been happening recently, um, it need not have been quite so difficult. What we have, we are addressing a very complex challenge and what, the way it's been addressed is in a non-complex way. And if our politicians understood and applied the logic of complexity, I think around the world, we would have not had the magnitude of the problem that we have had. Um, I can expand on this, but you may want to, to um, 
in, involve the other two before me. But I think the main thing is, um, is, is how do, you know, do we think differently in how do we address this, what you called wicked problems, and I'd simply call complex intractable problems. They appear intractable rather than being intractable because of the way we address them. And this is, this is a very, very clear example of how not to address a complex problem. And we can explore that um, further in, in a moment. Brilliant. Thank you. And a, a great, great note to kick off on. Thank you for that, Ethan. And Toby, would, would, uh, would you like to go next? Yeah, so I, I began thinking about this when I was a charity chief executive in the northeast of England. So it was personal for me because the way that our organisation was funded, commissioned and performance managed to work with some of the most kind of vulnerable and disadvantaged people in the northeast, that kind of standard new public management approach of um, kind of targets and uh, control-based performance measures it was supposed to make performance better. It actually made performance worse. So it made it significantly harder to do a good job working within public service. And it created the conditions where no one told the truth to each other. And if you create a performance management environment where no one tells the truth to each other, how do you expect any of this to get any better? And so the di when, we, when I began to look into why this was the case, um, the answer seemed to lie in the fact that exactly as Eve was saying, public sector funding and performance management treat complex problems as if they were simple and linear. And so it was that realization that said, okay, we need to find an alternative frame for the whole business of doing public management, which enables uh, public service to uh, respond effectively to complex environments. Brilliant, thank you. And that's something, yeah, it's definitely an area that we will hopefully dig into more um, as we go forward. And, and Marco, would you like to go next? Sure, thanks. Um... So I'm trained as an architect and uh, I was teaching at Harvard. It was about the year 2000, so about 20 years ago. And I kind of stumbled upon uh, healthcare and I really came from it from a product perspective. <clears throat> and uh, I was approached by a, uh, a newer radiologist that's you know, the doctor that looks at images of your brain to determine what's going on and said, hey, look, we have a problem with stroke patients. And so I went into the operating room in the hospital and so they take a look at it. And the problem was that the patients uh, had to go in the extreme cases through different devices, uh, imaging devices. So x-rays, CTs, MRIs, and the beds the patients were on were non-compatible. And so when you're in there, what you realize is you might have a, you know, 120 kilo man who is unconscious, who needs to be manually lifted from one bed to the other, has an IV, somebody trips on it, the wires, whatever, and so on and so on. And you realize that this is a mess. And, um, and so they asked us if we could design a bed that would be compatible with the different devices. And I actually realized that that was the wrong question to ask. The reason why they were non compatible was because there were interest, business interests that, that were working against it being compatible. There were standard issues that were working against it being compatible. And that actually, this was not a medical problem. This was a convergence of business issues, uh, of financial logics, of incentives and reimbursements, of professional disciplines, of how teams work and don't work, and of organizations. It was actually at the intersection of all of that. And we very quickly yes. realized that you may have very, very deep knowledge on financing, but if you're not looking at the bigger picture, it will be very reductive. And, right. uh, and so we very quickly proposed that we actually need to look at the whole cycle of care for strokes. Yes. And uh, yes. we spent four yes. years rethinking stroke delivery from cradle to grave, ground up. And, and if, you, if you took this approach, so this got me then into the, in the public sector, realizing that this is just one of many kinds of issues that A, was never designed, 
and B has a uh, you know uh, a reductive as 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 colleagues have already sort of mentioned a kind of reductive approach and you can see it in the in the different ministries that we have um, so any kind of real work that needs to happen on the issues that we're challenged on cut across our ministries and so I usually say most of the kind of innovation we need will happen in spite of our institutions not because of our institutions because we're not really enabling uh, doing that work. So I, I, I started with this product question and quickly realized, and I'll just end on this, that my big kind of aha moment, I remember I was in Houston meeting uh, Jim Grotta, who's sort of the, the godfather of stroke care in the world, right? He set a lot of the standards. And he was a physician that worked with uh, emergency services and a lot of the public sort of governance issues. And we were in an elevator and he says, I've been waiting for almost 20 years for a team like yours to come. I was trained as a doctor, and yet I've been struggling with questions of systems. Um, and I realized quite quickly that an architect's background is not a bad baseline to work off of. Um, I'll end there. We can dig. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a yeah, fascinating, fascinating story into, into how you got to this. Um, Great. Um, and so I guess to start off, you know, we've been talking about kind of the mental models, the paradigms. I think it may be interesting just to start there briefly before kind of digging a bit further into each of your um, kind of ex elaborating on your experiences um, and, and some of your findings from the projects. But um, I noticed that a common thread throughout your works is, you know, as we're saying, is challenging the conventional kind of paradigm of public administration in some ways. And um, you know, we'd love for you to kind of elaborate a bit more on this and, and also what do you see as some kind of maybe the strengths and shortcomings of the current paradigm? Um, uh, Toby, perhaps we could start with you for this and then Eve, Marco, if there's anything you would like to kind of add or add to that, then feel free to. Um, so maybe I'll start with the question about strengths of the current paradigm. So I think it's important to name the current paradigm because it has a name and it's a particular ideology and it's created like through particular teaching programs and blah, blah, blah. So it's called new public management, right? It has a name and it is a particular set of ideology that has been characterized by the three M's, markets, managers, and metrics, right? And what the, that as a paradigm does is good at is creating the illusion of certainty because it seeks to collapse kind of complex problems into um, quantifiable controllable situations and then it applies a, a control logic to all of those situations so uh, uh, it says for any uh, public service problem uh, you must be able to kind of collapse your objectives into what is measurable. So the whole smart targets business. Uh, um, and then you employ a whole cadre of people, managers, to, um, to uh, uh, make sure that the measurement is happening and to check performance against those metrics and uh, apply the control measures, reward or punishment mm -hmm. accordingly. Right? So the, whole, the, um, the consequence of all of that is a really strong illusion of certainty because people, you can produce dashboards with uh, data that says red, amber, or green about particular problems. Uh, it um, allows uh, public so senior public servants, leaders, and politicians uh, who they serve to um, say, we have got a grip of this problem. Look, we are, we are, we are, we are, uh, have divined appropriate outcomes and are rewarding people for producing them. Blah, blah, blah. It, so it, uh, it creates a whole narrative of certainty control, uh, which is, which is a, a, a really important kind of sense. It provides a sense of psychological safety in an uncertain world. The only trouble with all of that is none of it's true. It's all essentially a lie. Um, and so it, it is, and this is the, the reality gap there that is the kind of underlying reason why new public management always fails in complex environments. And so, uh, um, I mean, the, uh, what would you like, what would you like to say about, or what would you like us to say about um, 
kind of how that process of kind of replacing new public management and, and how we respond to the kind of challenges of that. Yeah, thanks for kicking off, uh, kicking us off there, Toby. Um, Eve, Marco, uh, curious to hear your thoughts or anything you'd like to add or, or, or even contradict maybe if there were anything you disagree okay. with. Um, yeah. So I think um, I'll start from, from what Toby actually said, which was, and, and I like that, it's um, control logic and the illusion of certainty. I think that is where we start. But I would disagree that they are lies because lies means intentionality. And in this case, I think it's, it is a misapprehension of the problem, of the challenge. Um, it is not, I don't think it's a deliberate lie. Um, it is deeper than that because if it's a deliberate lie, people would know what the truth is. In this case, um, we, you know, we don't actually appreciate um, the reality of the challenge. And I think this is where we start. First of all, we don't understand the nature of what we call um, the multidimensional problem space. Um, uh, these complex challenges, these complex problems have multiple dimensions. They're social, political, economic, physical, technical, financial, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we try to simplify it we try to control it, we try to measure it, we try to quantify it and reduce it to a state which is no longer realistic. And that is part of the problem. So first of all, we need to understand that these complex problems have multiple dimensions and how to address them. We cannot, they do not have solutions. They don't have simple one-off solutions. The idea that we've been working with for over 25 years is the idea of the enabling environment. How do you co-create? -co and I come back to something Toby said earlier about the, the, the lies. Part of this, uh, the thing that's missing in your first comment was the lack of trust. And in order to develop a working enabling environment, you need collaboration, cooperation, trust, co-creation. Now look at what's been happening during the past few months where um, individual citizens or groups or, or bigger, bigger uh, groups have actually self-organized to look at the problems they were facing in a totally different way. They became very creative because they were working together, they were supporting each other. And the other thing we have is the distributed intelligence, that you have a lot of different groups working together. Look at what we're trying to do in order to, to get a, 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 something to, to, to address the virus. There are hundreds, if not thousands of labs around the world. This is distributed intelligence at its best, but also collaboration and cooperation. And it's the two, both the distributed intelligence and the collaboration and cooperation that's gonna uh, help us to get a vaccine eventually. Uh, but it's much more than that. And I've only just touched the surface. Um, so um, I, I'd, 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 I'd like to go much more deeply into the reasons why we cannot address these problems, but um, I'll let Marco have a go first and, and then we can come back for a second, another round. Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, good points made and thanks Toby for kicking us off. And I think this question of intentionality and of lies is actually an interesting one and, and to be maybe the devil's advocate, devil's advocate, I would say that maybe I would subscribe to the idea that there are lies because there is a, a degree of awareness that the, our current way of working um, is, a, is not aligned with the nature of the issues that we're dealing with. So we're kind of playing a game. So I, I, you know, there's a lot that the, and I think we need to be a bit careful because I think there's a lot that the public sector is good at. And I think we also need to look at it's it in, in a kind of perspective of history um, it's, um, you know, if I look at my own country, uh, here in Finland, it has, uh, with great purpose, uh, created an industrial society it has, uh, delivered a concept of education to serve, uh, a new kind of workforce. Um, and it is literally within about a hundred years, 
uh, transform this country from a low income country where, you know, kids would uh, have a very short life expectancy to being one of the most prosperous in the world. And I think the public sector has had a very important role in that. Now, uh, I'm a, a big critic of the way the public sector is set up because I think today's world is quite different. Um, and uh, we're not set up to deal with the issues that surround us. And so I do a lot of work for the United Nations, for example, and, and many people may be familiar with, uh, they love ac acronyms, uh, I guess we all do, but SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I'm going to oversimplify them. There's like poverty and there's water and, you know, education and so on. And, and, and if you really want to think of them, you, you can't say that it's a Chinese menu, you know, that I'm going to choose the ones I'm going to do. Uh, it's more of a framework to remind you that if you want to deal with poverty, uh, having access to water and having uh, access to work and having other elements create the preconditions. And so they're inextricably exactly. Exactly. together. The problem with public sector right now and the issues that are most vexing to the public sector, be it the coronavirus, be it climate change, be it uh, healthcare, um, is that the public sector is pretty uh, organized in a way that is pretty hierarchical, uh, fragmented, and that they're independent ministries that have a lot of leeway that work in a very linear manner. You plan and then you implement. And the issues that we're trying to address are complex, interdependent, and highly ambiguous. So there's a, a fundamental mismatch with the challenge type and the tool that you're using. So for me, this argument of making government smaller is completely the wrong kind of argument. We need to reimagine government as it applies to these kinds of issues. Now, when it comes for government and permitting and dealing with ticket violations, it's probably set up pretty good at that kind of stuff, but not at the vexing stuff. Um, so a lot of the work we do is helping organizations rethink what work is and then what are the instruments for budgeting and so on that begin to get at this interconnected way of delivering value, for lack of a better word. But I'll maybe just pause there. Yeah, thank you. And as you were saying that, Marco, it uh, you know it reminded me reminds you of the, the the quote name of the person has just slipped my mind now. But that if all you have is a hammer, you know everything yes. looks like a nail. <laughs> and yes. you know it, it's it's not about um, you know throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. It's about understanding what works in certain contexts and which might be better suited in terms of mental models to to look differently. And I hope that's something we can unearth a bit more in this. In this but, conversation. Bowen, if I just, yeah, sorry. Can I slip in two little things and then I'll promise I'll, I'll talk a little bit later, uh, less later. But uh, I, I think at least, and, and I'll speak from my own perspective, which is narrow because the world's very diverse. But to say that I, I think we also need to recognize the cultural dimension of this. Um, in many parts of the world, this way of delivering public administration has been quite successful. Um, and, and so there's been a whole generation of people that have been schooled in this way of thinking. Um, and it's very hard to let go of what you think is a good governance model, exactly. what is good leadership. And the recognizing that what worked well in the past may not work well in the future is a very difficult, almost existential thing to put in front of people. Uh, because we're limited by our past experiences. We're the children mm -hmm. of those cultures. So there is this kind of cultural dimension that I think we sometimes underestimate. And we need to yes. figure out how we respect the past acknowledge what needs to be done, and then very quickly move forward. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, Eve, were you, were you going I was to just going to say, that? I agree entirely. It, it doesn't mean that you throw everything out, but you, you, you simply use uh, what is good from, from that past thinking, but realize that our present and future problems are of a different nature, and therefore we have to think fundamentally differently. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Marco in his in his last remarks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I'm hoping kind of you know a, a bit later on, maybe towards the end, we'll have some time to kind of talk more about these. Um, you know, what what might need to change and and where we kind of see see the future heading. But I think right now, one thing I'm aware is that you know there will be members of our community are. You know, looking to implement some of these ideas from systems thinking and complexity and, and systems innovation in contexts which might involve 
um, the public sector. Um, and I think one thing that might be quite valuable for them, because obviously, uh, you know, each, each of your cells and panelists have quite rich experiences in your own ways, to kind of elaborate a bit more on kind of your own journeys and some of what you've um, kind of uh, looked towards implementing. And so, Eva, if, if I could start with you, um, I understand that you've been working with national governments to collaboratively implement a new governance framework uh, centered around complexity theory. Um, you know, this is, this is very, very interesting. Are you able to elaborate more on this initiative? And, and, and yes, I, I, yeah, obviously I cannot discuss um, individual, the work we did with individual governments, um, but I can certainly talk about it. Um, in fact, I would, because this book is not written by me, I can highly recommend it. Um, and I will send you the details. It's called A New Synthesis of Public Administration by Jocelyn Bourgeon. Jocelyn Bourgeon is a Canadian, and she brought together um, six um, governments of Australia, Brazil, Canada, Netherlands, Singapore, and the UK to look at a new framework of governance for government. And, uh, and, and that was based very much on the work that I had been doing. I was their scientific advisor. And the framework that came up, um, that, that the group came up with, that is, you know, those six administrations working together, um, um, it, um, th they created a framework that brings together um, both um, public policy as well as civic um, results. So bringing together um, both government um, and collective power. Um, and it was very much thinking in, in, in quite a different way and trying to say, how can we um, work, um, how can governments um, change their way of thinking and their, the, the way they make policy to be able to address more effectively the problems that they're facing. And one of the things they did, um, or other we did, is, is we looked at various examples, um, as well as having an awful lot of, of, of discussions. And I want to, to mention one example, um, because it is very relevant to what we're doing now. Um, one of the old case studies that was looked at was the HIV AIDS epidemic in Brazil in the 1980s. And what happened now, now to paint the picture for you, um, Brazil at the time um, did not have the, the financial capacity or the resources to deal with the epidemic. Um, it, they, they could not afford to pay for the expensive drugs. They did not have the capacity. And I think this will sound um, rather familiar, not enough hospitals, not enough beds, not enough doctors and nurses. Um, also, because of the, of the geographic spread of the country, a lot of people did not have access um, to um, a medical infrastructure. So they, they had three very major problems um, and they were forced to do something differently. So what they did is they started working. Um, they realized that the government by itself could not address such a complex problem. So they started working um, with communities, with the church, with healthcare. It was, again, what I mentioned earlier, collaboration and cooperation um, and working together to actually um, start a new kind of discussion. Now, remember, this is a country also um, that, um, uh, you know, the... the, the um, religious background would make it very difficult to accept that you can help um, homosexuals um, because the, the thinking could well be, it was at the time, we're talking about the 1980s, early 90s, um, that um, you, know, you brought it on yourself. Um, and yet what they did very, very specifically expressed was that it had to be inclusive. The treatment was for everyone and therefore it was um, you know, systematic and participatory. So that was one of the examples that I wanted to bring in very, very practical, and they actually addressed it. So by um, 2002, um, it was um, quite significant. The um, HIV infection 
was 0.6% and stable. So they had addressed it by, by looking at it in quite um, a different way. And what happened was once we developed the framework, um, all the six governments started um, working with it. Um, the, I, I, I want to mention a couple of the principles that were fundamental. Um, one was exploring the space of possibilities. That means look at options. Don't carry on the way you've been doing in the past. What are the alternatives that are open to us? And I think that is absolutely key. Another was emergence. In other words, and, and it, it, the, a, a wonderful phrase came up from all that. It was serving beyond the predictable. Serving beyond the predictable. So in other words, you, you, you're allowing things that, that you cannot predict, that you can are totally uncertain into the future and you work with that uncertainty. You don't try to control it, you work with it. Um, you set up systems that are able to actually um, um, work with, 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 with that uncertainty. And, and, and things like self-organization, um, the enabling environment has to allow um, local citizens, local groups, um, larger groups to actually self-organize. And, and then we learn. The other point is learning, learning from these different experiments. How do we learn from each other and actually make fundamental changes um, to our practice? And I think the last thing I want to mention um, is um, the, the concept of co-evolution, which to me is one of the most fundamental and powerful. And what that means is, um, I'll give you a very simple example. If I were to take a decision or action which affected you, and as a result, you change your behavior. This is simple adaptation to changes in your environment. But if your changed behavior then came back and affected me to such a degree that I also had to change my behavior, what we have is reciprocal influence that changes the behavior of, of us that are interacting. So what they were observing, what they were seeing in practice was that these different groups were constantly co-evolving towards a new order. It was something totally new. It was not predictable. They were influencing each other and co-creating the new. And this is what we need to do now. So um, and I've thrown an awful lot of theory at you, but it is all grounded in practice. Um, and I'd like to hear from, 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 from Toby and Marco as well. Yeah, thank you so much. It was, for me, it was quite, um, you know, enlightening hearing about, you know, the, these, the, as you say, the, the, it's very grounded in the ideas, mm. in, in complexity, but it's been very acutely contextualized, very acutely applied. Um, and yeah, I think there were, there were some interesting threads there as well, uh, but I, I, and, and I'm sure we can go back to some of them. Um, but uh, to, to move on to you, Marco, um, in your work, you mentioned a lot, as you, as you did earlier, kind of the importance of taking this holistic approach to problem solving in the public sector and how this can often be contrary in some ways to how the institutions are typically set up. Um, but so given the importance of this, the, the, the holistic nature, what methods have you witnessed that you've found to be effective in nurturing this more holistic approach? Um, there's many things, but maybe point to a few sort of building blocks and I'm sort of, thinking out loud so they're not organized in any, um, you know, tremendously clever manner. Um, but, you know, so I'll make a very kind of simple analysis. If I, if, and I'll only speak badly of my own country because it's always easier to do that. So, you know, if I look at Finland um, and I think what's really, what are the big issues on the agenda? Certainly climate is. Uh, when I was at the Finnish Innovation Fund, we had a, a an initiative to, um, to, uh, and the objective was to try to transform cities to uh, zero carbon. Okay. So how do you take existing cities? And this was at the time, I don't know if people, how much people have followed and so on, but there were Mazdar and, and there were sort of eco cities in China. And these were all brand new cities that were being built from scratch 
to be ecological, whatever that meant. And some of them had, like Mazda originally had a, a carbon focus and then it kind of lost it uh, later on. And we kind of looked around the room and we said, you know, that's, that's great stuff. And everyone's getting really excited. But uh, to my last count in Europe, we don't have any new cities. <laughs> so what we're dealing with is a tremendous amount of legacy. So how do we build uh, interventions into cur current systems um, that transform the current logic to a preferred logic? So carbon intensive cities to zero carbon. And we can't shut the city down. So we were thinking about interventions and we came up with a, basically we built a city block in Helsinki. And by building something, and this is where maybe the practice of architecture is useful, this just happens to be a building, but done similar work in healthcare and others. But by building something, you force the issues. Uh, I have a, a, a dear colleague, uh, Brian Borer, I've had the pleasure to work with for years and he was on our team at, at, at the Finnish Innovation Fund. And he used to say, you know, what he loves about architecture is that uh, you know you got to put the plumbing somewhere? You got to agree on where the structure is going to be. You can't agree to disagree. And in policy, we frequently agree to disagree, and so we will kind of wishy-wash skirt around the issue. So when you actually make things, whether it's actually build a building um, or create a new system in a hospital, you're actually making very tough kinds of decisions. Now these are decisions that require many inputs. So to try to make a very uh, uh, fuzzy story, a bit more concrete, if I go to the Finnish government and I say, okay, sustainability, low carbon, really important. So where is the ministry that's dealing with this? There is none, right? So I need to go to the Ministry of Transport and Telecommunications to get the mobility bit. I need to go to the Ministry of Housing to get the building bit to go to the Ministry of the Environment to get the environment bit. I need to go to Ministry of uh, Employment uh, uh, to get the energy bit. Um, and so it's not set up. So one, one of the important things is, is how do you create cross-disciplinary, highly functional teams? We talk a lot about collaboration, but I think we're not specific enough. Uh, most people collaborate in a very transactional way. So I'll do my little bit for that, that article that you're reading. Um, I'll do my little bit for that. But when we talk about creative collaboration is how do you bring different disciplines around a table and rather than optimize a solution, or these are our options, or how we're going to weigh it, you create synthesis. You create new kinds of options on a table. Exactly. You're not constrained by the boxes that you were given, but you can actually create completely new things. So that would be one is how do you create cross-functional teams? The second is how do you create the financial incentives for that to happen? So a lot that I've talked for many years is how do you do things like total budgeting? Uh, because the flow of money will determine sort of where the levers and where the decisions happen. So in make decisions that, you know what, we're running a deficit. So we want 5% savings from the Department of Education. Great. And then five years later, we have uh, youth that are feeling more ill, mental health problems and so on, and we have a bigger bill to pay on the healthcare side of things. So what we've really done is they've done a tremendous job in the education department, but because their boundary for that problem was their internal one, they've just cost shifted, they problem shifted sort of issues. So can you set up a way in which you think of total budgets? So any kind of financial decision needs to be weighed against its impact across your society now and in the long term so you're not creating long-term liabilities so i I'll, I'll just stop on those two very simple ideas mm. of an integrated way of working and then to fuel that resource that with a logic that's aligned with it because what Absolutely. we frequently do is we set up the logic of a, a team but then we lead it as if they're separate individuals and we resource it as if it's an exception to the system or we resources as if it's seven separate people. And so you'll never get the impact. And then people at the end of the day can tell you, I told you so teamwork was not going to be so transformative. Yeah. yeah so teamwork. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the approach to kind of breaking down in some ways, the barriers, but they're not physical barriers. They're kind of in a way almost emergent, mental barriers but just kind of in the natural in the way of organization that actually can be 
detrimental in a way to understanding yeah. problems more holistically. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to add here, Bowen. I, I think, yes, there is a kind of, let's say, psychology to it. But I think there's some very actionable and, 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 and sort of clear elements to it. And that's why, you know, if as an architect or as a designer, we were trained to shape buildings, so shape concrete and, and steel. When we work on systems and in the public sector, what we're shaping are financing. What we're shaping is the logic of investment. What we're shaping is how policies are made, right? So when you look at those things, you can see how the money flows. It's really tough investigative work, but you go into the ministries and you actually ask, how does the money flow? And can we make the money flow differently? And what are the mechanisms? And if you don't have them, then you create them. So there's a soft side to it, but there is a very hard side that in a way institutionalized a way of working that's not effective. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and thanks for clarifying that. Um, brilliant, thanks. And so Toby, to move on to you, um, a central theme, um, and so Eve talked about kind of learning, this, this, this nature of learning within public sector, which I found very interesting. And, and this is quite a central theme of, of your work, uh, is this, you know, the promoting the emergence of these learning systems, as you describe it, within these governmental organizations. And, and, and I'm curious to, to ask, you know, why do you see learning as such an important feature of innovation, in your opinion? And yeah, what have been some of your findings and learnings from these initiatives? Um, so, I mean, it, it essentially, as soon as you acknowledge a, that the problem is uh, any problem is complex, you are saying that um, we can't predict in advance what good is what good is going to look like. And so, from a public management perspective, it means that the whole uh, control mentality and perspective will necessarily fail because you can't apply a performance management. Uh, approach with defined success criteria and reward or punishment in relation to defined success criteria when uh, in a complex environment. Because by definition, you can't define to a good enough extent what success is going to look like because it's emergent. That means that in a complex environment, the only mechanism that, that is at all feasible for performance improvement is learning. So you can't use control for performance improvement in a complex environment. Now that has some really radical consequences because it means that our, the entire edifice of performance management for that is that was created kind of in the private sector in the 80s and, in, and like in, uh, brought over into the public sector through the new public management mechanisms doesn't work in a complex environment. And so you need an alternative form of performance management in order to uh, address complex environments. And so the, uh, what we did was we worked with organizations to say, okay, if you acknowledge that the problem is complex, how do, we, how do you improve? How does everyone get better at what they do? So we started off by asking people, how do they experience and respond to complexity? And when we asked them that question, public servants, voluntary sector organizations, whatever, they started talking about relationships and trust. And so we thought, oh, that's interesting. So we then, because uh, and picking up on all the themes that kind of Marco and Eva have been talking about. And so then we asked them, okay, how do you use relationships and trust to manage more effectively in complexity? And when you work through these things, basically trust is the key unlocking thing, right? Because as soon as you say it is the job of public service, yeah, in a complex environment, you have to, have to, there is, there's just no real alternative. You have to be able to trust the people doing the work to make judgments because you can't make those judgments from afar because you can't possibly have enough information to make good judgments in real time from a long way away. So yeah, in order to do effective work in complex environments, you have to trust the people doing the work to make like really important decisions about prioritization, about policy, blah, 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 blah. So that means effectively devolving decision-making about public service into the work, into the front line. Yeah? That is the necessary management approach to this. And so what, and the kind of the important um, thing that lies behind all of this is to help people see that the choice they were making about how to manage before using this control mindset, using the tools and techniques and mindset of new public management is a choice. 
Management doesn't have to be done like that. And so helping people to see that they're the first choice that they face when doing anything to do with public service is the choice of paradigm for how they do public management, public administration. So you can do it like this, like you've always been doing it for new public management, and this will fail in a complex environment in this and this way. Look, here's all the evidence about it. And if you choose to manage in this way, that's, that's fine, that's your choice, but we will hold you accountable for making that choice because you will you will necessarily have to account to these people for choosing to work, to do public management in a way that we know fails in complex environments so right once you help people to understand that they are making an active choice to manage in this way or manage another way then the whole process of public service management becomes up for grabs and you can make the process of how people do public management, a learning experiment, right? So you create environments in which people can learn and experiment to manage differently. And that, so or essentially what we've done with creating this alternative uh, paradigm for public management, this human learning systems approach that we've helped organizations develop is to say, um, uh, here are a set of principles, and they're exactly the principles that even Marco have been talking about, because the, the, the set of principles that work in complex environments are, the, there's, there's a limited list of these things, right? Um, how are you going to find the way to, to do that in your, in your context? And we can't tell you, there isn't a recipe to follow. The only way that you're going to find that out is, to, is for you to undertake your own experiments with trust and collaboration and using learning as a performance improvement mechanism. So what are the ways that you're going to experiment with adopting that approach in your context? And essentially all we've done is wrapped some capacity for learning and experimentation around that and, and kind of recorded each of those as case studies so that they can be published so that other people can learn from blah, 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 blah. But from our perspective, the first, the, the thing that unlocks all of that is helping people to see that they, are, that they make a choice about how to do public management. And once they recognize that it's a choice that they can do like this or they can do like this, everything else becomes possible then. Thank you. Can I add something to, to what yes. Mark uh, Toby just said? Um, what you've just described, Toby, which is those multiple experiments, um, um, we call my, uh, multiple um, micro strategies. In other words, you do not have one single strategy because it may apply under one certain set of conditions. What you're doing is constantly experimenting um, with, with different um, uh, strategies um, and it in diff under different conditions and then learn from both the ones that succeed and the ones that fail. And the, the key thing is to understand failure is not a bad thing. If you, if you say what you need to change to make it work and then go on and change what you did before is that constant iterative learning that will get you to the success. Exactly, and it because in that complex environment, it, if you're not failing, it means that you're not actually engaging with the complex environment. You're not you, trying. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and so like this, like one of the um, one of the ways that we can demonstrate that new public management fails is because it suppresses failure. It, it means exactly. that people exactly people, it means that people are terrified to fail, and so people end up doing everything in their power to yes. not have to make a decision? Yes. Mm. That's uh, right. Okay, sorry, Absolutely. I think you were... Yeah, yeah I yes. wanted to, because I think we're, we're uh, on a, a kind of a central kind of question. And so I wanted to just connect very briefly these terms, complex learning and experimentation. Um, you know, there are things that public sector governments do that are very complex. I don't know. I can imagine commissioning a nuclear power plant is a very complex thing. There's everything from environmental studies to regulatory stuff to legal stuff to the power plant itself and so on. It's not an easy task. So what are we talking about here that's different than that? Because I think governments are set up quite well to do that kind of stuff that I just described. Right? And so for me, there, there is a driving principle uh, to make a distinction here. 
And I think a lot of people, especially recent, are using two terms, uh, perhaps a bit liberally, but I understand why, which is risk and uncertainty. And so I'll use those terms strictly in a statistical manner, which means that risk is we know the probabilities of failure. You know, we have the data. And uncertainty is that we don't have probabilities. We don't know. And so the, the classic example I always give is that the, when we went to the moon for the first time in 1969, that was not a question of risk. There were no previous moon missions that we could use as a statistical baseline to say what's a 50-50 chance, or it's a 10% chance, or it's a 5% chance. After that first Apollo mission to the moon in 69, we had a baseline. And so the next one was a question of risk. The problem was that our probabilities were very weak. We only had one, right? So I would say the things that we're really struggling with when we talk about complexity is that they have a high degree of ambiguity. Um, and I think power plants don't have a high degree of ambiguity. It's a giant machine and we know how they work and this is how you sort of implement them. But when we're talking about climate change, there's a lot of ambiguity with that. Uh, so what becomes really important is if we make that distinction and you recognize that governments are set up to deal with risks, that's why they like to study things. They want to know the probabilities. And then it's easy for leadership to make decisions that now we're making, taking this kind of risk, which is in the best interest of the people. Now, you put in front of a politician and say, we don't know. We just don't know. There is no basis for decision making. And it's not that the individual is not courageous. It's almost from a legal perspective you will be challenged if you don't have a basis for making your decision, right? So it stalls things. Now, if you recognize that we're dealing with questions that don't have probabilities, the example I frequently give is, imagine we're gonna make up, come up with a completely innovative tax system. So you know what we're gonna do? The five of us or how I remember people on this call are gonna get together and we're gonna do a first experiment based on our theory of what might work using monopoly money. And then we're gonna see how it goes. And then we say, hey, that worked pretty well, but we had some kinks in it. So let's get everybody on the call and their friends involved, and we're going to do it a second time. And then we're going to correct it again and do it a third time. We're going to get everybody in London. We're going to use real money. So what have we done is we've iterated. I hate to use jargon, but we've iterated. We've taken one idea with no risk because of monopoly money, so no one's going to lose their money, that we created the first baseline of probabilities. And then we made those probabilities more robust. And then we made them even more robust. So the way of delivering is not anymore centrally planning, vetting all the risks, coming up with the perfect plan, and then boom, delivering, but rather engaging with people and through a process of learning, beginning to roll out a constantly adjustable idea. And so then we don't lead with policy, but we lag with policy. Once we figure out the model that work, we come in and we institutionalize with policy. Right? So what I'm trying to describe and with hand gestures is to suggest that when you understand that we don't have probabilities, you need to organize and lead and resource work in fundamentally different ways. And so experimenting, iterating, uh, doing all these things is not because they're cool but because they fall in the logic of how do you translate questions of uncertainty into questions of risk. And once you have enough probabilities, governments are actually quite good at kind of doing the rollout stuff. Mm. Can, I, can yeah. I add something Interesting. to that? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, so one of the, um, the, the ways that we've seen public management adapt to, uh, to, for a new way of doing public management is to take that idea of iterative learning and to say, actually, that is what we will commission organizations to do. So rather than purchasing, so particularly in the, uh, uh, the world that I work in, particularly in the kind of human services. Thing. So uh, let's say, um, how do you respond to the needs of, of people who've experienced homelessness, right? Uh, and so up till now, what people would have done is say, OK, what does the evidence say about what's the best uh, uh, policy response to homelessness? Let's commission organizations who deliver that evidence based response and let's performance manage them uh, to, to how well they uh, uh, they perform in fidelity to the model of that evidence based practice. We know that that fails because the. Uh, 
uh, the nature of the problem of homelessness is a dynamic problem. It multifactorial, interdependent, it changes. And so even if something was best practice 10 years ago, it means the nature of the problem of homelessness has changed by now. Therefore, what was put best practice 10 years ago is no longer appropriate. So you, in a human services world, you can't, you never get to the point of having enough statistical information to be able to commission an off the shelf product that you know will work. And our attempt to get to that point, to scale a thing that we know works, is part of the problem of public management. So the change that we've seen is organized, is governments, rather than commissioning a service, we will, it will work in this way, what they are commissioning is the capacity for organizations to learn and adapt continuously. So they aren't trying to, they don't produce a service specification, a tender that says, you must do this, 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 and this. What they do is say, we, all, we, we will find the organizations that we trust to learn well and to engage with citizens in the right way. And we will purchase their capacity to continuously learn and adapt. And that's what commissioning can become in a complex environment. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think um, it's been interesting, this thread that we've gone through. I mean, I think one thing that sticks out for me, Eve, is very on at the start when you mentioned about this distributed um, distributed intelligence or distributed um, co-working. Um, and we seem to have taken that down uh, further thread of experimentation, how you do that. And even, yeah, with your... Uh, specific example of commissioning, not saying this is exactly what we need, because how do you know that when it's emergent, but actually using this trust as a lever to kind of create more of a platform for things to emerge rather than a determined list of outcomes. Um, and so I, I think this is a good time. We've just, just reached the hour point to bring in some audience questions. Um, and so we've, we've talked about some, I guess, solutions, even though I don't really like that word, but ways that we can address certain maybe shortcomings of the traditional paradigm of, of, of public services or public sector. But what do we view as some of the main challenges that we face in achieving some of these more holistic outcomes or complexity informed outcomes that we've discussed? Um, Eve, would you like to would you like to start with this question? And, and if anybody else wants to kind of chip in, then feel free. Um, okay, I think there are um, two main challenges I would like to, to, to start with. Um, I think it's, 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 we need to do two things. One is to avoid the danger of oversimplification, because especially governments, when they are faced with a very complex issue, a very complex challenge, um, they do try to oversimplify it so that they can feel that they can address it and gain control. And the second point that happens is to exaggerate the complexity of the issue. So there are two things that are happening um, and we can see it, we can observe that happening all the time, the way that governments respond because they are not trained to think in a complex way. Instead of saying, this is a complex issue, I need the right tools, methods, and ways of thinking to address it as a complex issue. Um, they try to either oversimplify it or say it's too complex, we cannot do anything about it. And I think uh, you know something like climate change falls into the second category where it is just beyond our comprehension. And yet even climate change can be addressed more effectively. I can assure you of that. We cannot solve it, but we can address it more effectively. And I think that goes for, for, for most complex challenges. So it's trying to avoid um, those two pitfalls um, will make a very good start. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Marco, Toby, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Otherwise I can move on to the next question. I'll, I'll just add very um, sort of briefly, more of a question. If we recognize that how government is set up and I'm talking about to the public administration a little bit, um, that that is an engine that has served us well so we need to redesign the engine of government, can organizations change themselves? And I think ultimately, no. 
because whenever there's a change, you know, we're going to innovate or we're going to start doing things. It's the, it has to fall within the organizational logic for the organization to approve it. So there has to be an external irritant or there has to be an external yes. strategy, yes. I think, to transform yes. this. So that's sort of uh, one. The other thing I'll just put out there, and I know we're veering a little bit, but just as a kind of placeholder, I think a lot of these complex kinds of issues we're dealing with, uh, there's a huge systems component of it. How do you work uh, with uncertainty? How do you work in an integrated way and all of that? But we have to understand that we've created a world that people have invested in. And so I think until we address, uh, until we don't address the legacy lock-ins, you know, um, all the money that's tied in investments around carbon, all of the money that's tied around the care sector to deliver the kinds of outcomes that we don't want. Somebody's going to have to step in and write those off as losses so that we can move on. And until we do that, it's going to be very hard for us to transition to even the best kind of blueprints that we may come up with. Yeah. Um, and just briefly on that, one of the things I would say is that um, the world of politics and the world of public management exist in kind of symbiosis, right? The, we got the particular type of public management and public administration we did because it was tied to a political project. Um, and that our way of doing kind of public management has now become embedded in the discourse and language that politicians speak. So uh, a politician will stand up and put in their manifesto or on the hustings, I will reduce recorded crime by 5%. Yeah. So the, I, the way of doing public management has become embedded in the language of politics. And that makes, like, if politicians are going to promise it as part of their political discourse that they will set targets to reduce particular things, then it becomes impossible to work in a more effective systems way. So part of the challenge for doing public administration, public management differently, is we need a different type of political discourse to really underpin that. And that means that we need to have a different kind of conversation in the media about accountability. We need to, it, is, it requires simultaneous work in the kind of domains of public management, politics, media, in order to create and embed the kind of changes that we're talking about. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and so I guess this question is kind of going further down this, this thread, um, but it's, it, it, the question is that the vast majority of government workers and decision makers have very little understanding of systems, this, this systemic perspective and complexity concepts and tools. How do we get over that? And yeah, whoever wants to kind of chip in or, or answer that. So I didn't quite first. understand the question. Can you just clarify? I'm not sure what it is you're asking. Yeah, it, it's, it's just kind of highlighting that one of the barriers um, to maybe helping to adopt this more holistic view is that a lot of the people that work within government and the decision makers there have very little understanding, or quite new to this understanding of, of systems and these complexity concepts that we talk about. So how do we overcome this hurdle in introducing this, this new approach? Well, yeah. I, I, I would um, say two things. Um, one is to shift from, let me put it this way. I think you can talk till you're blue in the face and if people's day-to-day -day life does not match with the words that you're saying, they'll find it intellectually stimulating and so on and so on, but they'll keep doing what they do. So, and it goes back to this question of how do you change organizations or how do you change institutions? And so I think the kind of, you know, going back to sort of Toby's comments about what's the kind of ideology that we've kind of instilled into the public sector, uh, sort of the notion of change management is one of them, which I'm kind of adverse to. And it's, you know, this kind of idea that you move the boxes in the right way and you can move an organization from A to B. Um, I don't think that's a very effective way. Um, you, you lead with a lot of fear. We're going to move all these boxes with a lot of some promise that may or may not deliver. So I'd like to flip that around. And so I would say, let's start with a promise. And so what we've done, which we've found quite effective, is you get people to actually start behaving differently. 
Um, so if you think integrated teams is one of the very simple cornerstones of this, then start doing that and curate it really well so that that experience is fabulous. People have fun and people deliver above and beyond expectations. Okay? And they will be the best spokespeople for this logic and they will talk about it through their experiences and so on. And so what you do in the organization is you create pressure for it to change to a new way of working. So again, you, know, you don't start with a policy and then ask people to change their behavior, but you instill a new behavioral pattern that creates the demand for this new way of working. So that would be one, is we need to pay much more attention and be much more strategic at, um, at, at, at sort of how do, we, uh, how do we intervene in there. Maybe I'll just cut it short. Uh, there's something else, but let's let it be there. Thank you. Eve? Yes, uh, actually, I think that most people in public administration are familiar with systems, at least in my experience and with most of the government officials I have dealt with. They, they think um, in systemic terms. That is not alien to them. What they cannot do is take it the next step very often, um, which is to, to actually how do you... Um, uh, operationalize it? How do you make it practical? How do you actually um, create a way of thinking and procedures um, to, to, to um, address it? And the way I find this is most um, effective um, is actually to work with them to try and understand in depth a particular challenge that they are facing. Because only when they understand that challenge in depth we call it the problem space. It's only when they really, really understand it because uh, most people, most policymakers, their instinct is to jump much too quickly to, to, to a solution. And that is what you have to say, no, you cannot jump too quickly to a solution, not until you've understood that problem you're facing in great depth. Once you have done that, then you're more than halfway to actually addressing it effectively. And that is what happens. You, you take them through a process which is quite painful for them to, to be honest and to understand what the real issues are and how they interact and influence each other. And then and once you've done that, um, th that process, then you say, okay, how do we address it and address it in a way that will be sustainable over time, because a, solu a simple solution is not sustainable. An enabling environment is. A co-evolving enabling environment will continue to keep on addressing the problem as it is changing over time. So um, I th as I said, I, I think they, they do think um, systemically. I think they've been brought up to think systemically. They just need to be um, taken to that next level um, which I think makes it much more effective to address, you know, wicked complex problems. Um, go ahead. Yeah, s s sorry, just very briefly. I think that's a very good point. Um, and, you know, I, I succumb to sometimes uh, ill logics. Uh, and I'll, I'll say, oh, but, you know, there's so few people that can do this kind of stuff or that. And so sometimes if you kind of like take categories off of people or how we look at the world, um, and you just kind of took a bigger lens, you would see that actually, and I agree with Eve here, that uh, there's actually quite a lot of people in the public sector that kind of get it. Um, I would say by training, by nature, economists are kind of built that way. Yeah. I think where maybe economists struggle is the kind of forward way of working because <laughs> yeah. it's a lot backwards uh, uh, sort of extrapolation. And, and the connection between, well, what does this mean in practice? So there's that practice component that's uh, quite difficult. I think there's something that I was always frustrated very much because there's a recognition. So you have an asset there that you could work with, uh, but how do you make a different way of working? How do you take ideas into action? And you know, there's exactly. a great impression of, uh, you know, I'd rather have the devil I know than the angel I don't. Uh, because people are much more comfortable with the problems that they're familiar with than the promise that they are not. So I think we need to get very good at finding those strategies by which we get people to leap over. Uh, we used to do a thing we'd call the risk ledger. Uh, and the idea of a risk ledger is that we always underestimate the risk of the status quo way of working, and we always overestimate the, status, uh, the risk of doing new things. So if we actually articulate it and put it as a ledger, 
we begin to realize that misbalance. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do, but the thing that's always missing is that this kind of work is not resourced properly. Uh, and it's at the margins. Um, when we look at uh, in, in investments in the public sector that are focused on creating new ways of working, it, literally, if I go to the Finnish government, it's close to zero euros. If I go to Amazon and I look at their R&D budget, it's $27 billion, you know? So we, we're having governments that aren't investing in new ways of thinking and operating, um, helping people to get over that hump from what they know, don't know to what they know. Um, and everything around them is, is actually heavily investing in that learning capacity. And, and so I think the, the, the danger here is that all this innovation work is actually a way for governments not to innovate because they will always point, oh, we're doing that. Oh, we're doing that fun project over there. Oh, we have a team doing here, which takes the pressure on the mainstream of working to have to change. So I think one of the big challenges is how do we take this conversation that is kind of at the margins and very quickly help it inflict the mainstream way of working? Yeah, and I think just on that note, because I think that's such a, you know, important question, you know, are there any thoughts that, that, that emerge? I mean, I know that we've covered this in a few threads, but how do we overcome that problem? I think uh, our, our listeners would be quite curious just if there's any, you know, short, short answers for, for that or what comes to mind for, for, for anyone, any of the panelists. So the, the, the strategy that I've found quite effective in this space is, um, uh, Framing, framing all of this as an experiment in public management, because you can all within any given kind of public management environment, you will find people who recognise that the current paradigm has failed and is failing. Right? Anyone with any experience. So, that, so that I would challenge the idea that the the previous paradigm has been successful for twenty years. It hasn't been successful, really. It's covered up the its failures in the production of good looking data mostly um people involved in public management know that it hasn't been working and that there is enough of them to that creates that sense of dissonance between the existing paradigm and their day-to-day -day, day experiences of doing this stuff and you can and those people are um uh have the energy and possibility for change and if you can help them to create the permission space to experiment with doing yes. public management differently so not not just is it and mark is exactly right the problem of let's try a little project here and a little project there the experiment is with doing public management differently and if you can create that as a uh, uh, enable them to create their own permission spaces to run those kind of experiments that seems to be a way to create a kind of broader change. Yes. Yeah. Can I just add to that? Yeah, I agree entirely. This permission space is fundamental. But also, don't forget that if we were to try and do it at a very big scale at the outset, um, a government is going to be very, very nervous to do it. A large organization is going to be very nervous at applying it to you know, a global organization. My advice usually is start small start a small experiment and work with a really difficult problem and then see um, how thinking differently, working differently is going to address it. Because once you have that success in a small scale, which means you are not risking um, too much, um, you then demonstrate that it can be done and it can be done effectively and successfully. So that would be my advice, start small and then spread it out and constant learning. Um, and because then you reduce, you reduce the fear and the risk of trying it um, at the big scale at the outset. Uh, I, I, I just wanna to add two, two quick maybe points on this. Uh, one is, and I'm speaking from kind of a practitioner perspective and colleagues who do a lot of work to do, to figure out kind of new kinds of solutions. <laughs> Keep it very vague. And, and I think maybe one of the one of our downsides has been that we've uh, 
put a lot of effort in articulating why a new way of working is, is a preferred way of working uh, or holds promise. I think we need to do a much better job at actually showing and illustrating and, and very precisely articulating the risks of the status quo, make them much more self-evident, going back to some of the comments before, and, and actually demonstrate how the risks currently are far exceed the, the kind of common sense of what those might be. Put it on paper, and then it, it, it's a context, so it depends, you know, so I, what might work in Finland may not work somewhere else, and what might work this year may not work next year, but as a kind of idea is if that's not enough, is quite literally put government on notice. Uh, because the moment you put it in writing and you put it out there, there is suddenly now an obligation to say, do I choose to disregard this information that seems to be put together very, very thoroughly and potentially pay the consequences down the line? Or am I going to take it seriously? So I think we need to do a far better job at that. Um, and I, what I found useful then going to the kind of small entry points is to figure out what are the entry points into the system. And two things I would say. One is find the places where the current way of working has constantly failed. In Finland, exactly. there was boys, 16-year-old exactly. yes. boys kept uh, dropping out of the school system, regardless of however good it is, right? So work on that because the expectations are low and then hopefully have success. And yes. be clear right. that uh, the mantra of success uh, fails uh, soon and frequently uh, that the private sector has does not apply in the public sector. Because at least my experience has is when you fail early, all the naysayers will come very quickly and say, I told you so. And that door that you opened will be shut very, very quickly. So you need to figure out where are the very low hanging fruits where you can have quick wins and then the last thing I'll just say is I'm uh, and I'm just pushing back in terms of the spirit of an intellectual discourse is I'm adverse to the idea of experiments because they're usually designed to fail. They're designed to be standalone where you either prove or disprove an idea. And I think we need to think of it much more as a kind of new product launch. This is the beginning of a new logic. And so what you need to have is the default for resourcing that flip from what it currently is. In an experiment, you get money, and then we'll see what happens. And then you're going to ask, you know what's the hardest thing in life is get people to agree. So then you're going to do the hardest thing that you did once to get the experiment, and you're going to keep repeating it every six months. So the likelihood is this thing is going to die. So what you do is you say, we have this hypothesis, and you know what? We think we are going to succeed. We're going to come up with a transformative service. So we think this will require over five years this much money, and then we'll have these milestones. And at any point, you guys can kill it, right? So make people to agree, make them agree on killing something rather than giving it the green light. So a lot of this work has to have the kind of systems approach, but you have to curate a lot of the other elements to make it happen, uh, so to speak. So change the defaults of how this stuff gets resourced. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, I, I mean, for me personally, it's been deeply enriching, and I think I was really fascinated by kind of the overlaps and 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 the you know the quality of this discussion. So I want to really really thank you for thank you for taking the time to discuss this with us today. I think just as a as a final point. Um, for any of the listeners, how do they um, kind of keep in touch with you or, or keep on top of what you're currently doing? How do they, how do they stay in the loop? Uh, uh, maybe Eve, Toby, Marco, just because that's the audio that I see this on my... <laughs> on my well, room. I think probably all of us are on LinkedIn. It's the best way to get in touch. Okay, fantastic. Twitter, so, LinkedIn, yep. So yeah, Twitter or like... You can contact us via the new website that we've created for uh, bringing together all the knowledge we can find around it, which is uh, humanlearning.systems, www.humanlearning.systems. Thank you. Uh, and is it the same for you, Marco? Uh, Twitter? Uh, well, it's a different website, mm. but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn, uh, yeah, those would be the easiest ways. Yeah, it is. LinkedIn fantastic. is very good. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so, so, so much um, for joining us today and for, for all the listeners. Um, and I wish you all uh, a great day or rest of the day wherever you are in the world. And, um, and yeah, keep in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining.